So today we're going to be exploring the idea of the end of life review. Now, those who were on the search committee that found me or allowed me to find you may recall that one of my greatest joys, we are needed. One of my greatest joys is when I find a concept repeated in various different traditions. And so today is one of those ideas, concepts that's repeated in numerous different traditions. And that is the idea that there's some kind of end of life review, some cases, some kind of judgment that happens upon our death. The last judgment is sometimes determined to be an individual process, the judging of thoughts and words and deeds of a person. Often in the religious traditions, the person doing the judging is actually God or a God or a spirit kind of looking at you objectively and looking at your life and then making some sort of determination. In the Western prophetic religions, Zoroastrianism, Islam, <clears throat> and Christianity, the notion seems to have arisen from the Egyptians, perhaps. They're very similar, all of these traditions, what they say. So I'm going to go through several of them so that you can hear the similarities and the differences. So Zoroastrianism was founded by the Iranian prophet Zoroaster. It teaches that after death, the soul waits for three nights by the grave and on the fourth day goes to the bridge of the requiter where the person's deeds are weighed. If the good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, then the person, even by a little bit, it says, the person can move forward into paradise, across the bridge to heaven. If the bad deeds outweigh the good, the bridge becomes too narrow for the soul to cross, and it plunges into a dark and cold abyss referred to as hell. Fortunately, in this tradition, there's still hope because Ahura Mazda, the wise Lord, will resurrect all human beings at the end of days and restore the world to goodness. In Islam, there's a rich history and imagery associated with the expansion of the doctrine of the last judgment. The Day of Judgment is one of the five cardinal beliefs of Muslims. After death, people are questioned about their faith by two angels, the angel Munkar and the angel Nak Nakir. The soul of a martyred person goes straight to paradise, which may explain some things. Others go through a type of purgatory where at doomsday, everyone dies and then they're resurrected and then they're judged according to the records that are kept in two books. So everybody dies and once everybody's dead, then they all get resurrected and then everybody gets judged together, but individually, if you can understand that. They're judged according to the records kept in these books, and each person has two books. One book is all the good deeds, and one book are all the bad deeds. The weight of the book tied around a person's neck will determine the consignment to paradise or to hell. So if your good deed book is heavier, you go to paradise. If your bad deed book is heavier, you go to hell. 
in the ancient Egyptian religion, a dead person's heart was judged by being placed on a balance held by the god Anubis. So, you know, two sides, weights on each side. <clears throat> the heart, which contained a record of all the deceased's actions in life, was weighed against the feather of the goddess Ma'at. Scales, heart, feather. This feather was the symbol for truth and justice and helped determine whether the de deceased person had indeed been virtuous. If the heart was light, thus indicating a person's comparative goodness, the soul was allowed to go to the blessed region ruled by Osiris, God of the dead. If the heart was heavy, the soul might be destroyed by a hybrid creature called the Devourist. Scary, huh? <laughs> well, then we have Christianity, and most of us are familiar with some form of the Christian idea of heaven and hell and judgment. It usually is, it's meant to happen for everybody finally at the second coming of Jesus Christ. It is an individual judgment. It's the weighing of souls, the separation of the saved and the damned, and a consignment to heaven forever or hell forever. So over spans of thousands <coughs> of years and many varied cultures, this idea that there's some kind of review of what kind of human being you have been in your lifetime exists. With that as a backdrop, I found it interesting that in 1995, Ian Stevenson, MD, and Emily Williams Cook, PhD, professors and researchers at the University of Virginia's Division of Personality Studies, Department of Psychiatric Medicine. That is a mouthful. Mm -hmm. So UVA, my alma mater, my daughter's alma mater, has a Division of Personality Studies in the Department of Psychiatric Medicine. They got interested in what had been called by some people a near-death experience. And they wanted to find out more about that. So they accumulated 122 cases. Now, they published this article in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases. So this is a scholarly article written by two professors <coughs> who decided to take this rumor that they've been hearing over the years of people having these experiences when they had near-death situations or when they had been resuscitated and came back. Um, so what they were interested in was the whole experience. And as you know, the whole experience varies from person to person. Uh, it has certain common characteristics, often something like a tunnel with a light at the end of it, often being met by family members mm. or religious figures. They became very focused on this idea of an end of life review. <coughs> as part of that experience. So they interviewed all these people and not all of the people that they interviewed who'd had something that you would refer to as a near death experience an NDE had a life review, but many of them did. In the introduction to their article, um, they reported, sorry, in the introduction to the article, they reported that one of the earliest people to describe such an experience was Admiral Francis Beaufort of the British Navy when he almost drowned in 1847. That's one of the earliest ones that's actually mm -hmm. in writing on the record. 
you can imagine that people, if they've been having this experience in the last hundred years, were having it before then, but maybe they didn't share so much, and maybe nobody took a record, you know, recorded it. So in 1847, Admiral Francis Beaufort said, the whole period of my existence seemed to be placed before me in a panoramic view. And he said that that happened at a time when he almost drowned. Now, about half the people in the study, the 122, about half of them reported experiencing some kind of judgment of life. Of those experiencing the judgment, two thirds of them said that they judged themselves. <clears throat> that the experience was one of seeing their life flash before them. Some have described it as like watching a movie. Some have said it happens all at once and they can't explain how we can do that, but they're on the other side. But two thirds of them said that they were using their own standards to review and judge what they had done in their lifetime. Before we started the service, we had a little discussion here in Fernandina about perfection. So maybe you want to lower your standards <laughs> a little bit if you're going to have to review your life and use your own standards to judge how well you did. About a third said that they were judged by a being of light or a god or some other benign presence. These other presences were never described as censorious. That is, they were leading the judgment of the person, but they weren't there to send anybody to hell. They weren't there to micro-criticize everything that has happened in your life. They were just there making it happen. They were invariably perceived as loving and all forgiving. So frankly, as between myself and the loving and all forgiving spirit entity, I would rather that person <laughs> be judging my life than me. I'm just saying. Some of the people who experienced a life review said it had a profound effect on their later behavior which led Stevenson and Cook to make this statement at the end of their article. They said, one may ask why, among all possible mental processes, a considerable proportion of persons having these experiences report the feature of a life review. The life review is by no means a pleasant experience, and almost half of our subjects believed they underwent a judgment of their past conduct. If death is extinction, that would seem to be of no value and also far from the euthanasia effect suggested by M. McCorey in 1960, the end of that quote. M. McCorey was a, a German scientist who also took an interest in this phenomenon and thought that any phenomenon that people reported because many reported seeing family members, beloved family members, and God or Jesus or some other religious figure, that this was just the body's way of comforting a person who was dying. But this phenomenon of a life review doesn't seem to match that notion because the people who were reporting them were saying there were places that were painful in there. There were things I didn't want to have to see again. So being good scientists, and I would say like good Unitarian Universalists, though I don't think they were, <laughs> they wondered why life reviews happen, which led them to muse upon the following. They said, they asked, is it possible to ascribe to the life review some function or purpose other than that of obtunding? That's their word, obtunding, I think obfuscating, covering over probably. The fear of death as one senses its approach. Perhaps it would have a purpose if life continues after death, 
because the person experiencing it might profit from it by amending his or her conduct. That is what many of those who have had a life review when near death assert. So many of the people who had had this near death experience asserted that their behavior changed as a result of it, mm -hmm. that they became, in many uh, cases, they became more mindful of the effects of their actions and their words on others. Stevenson and Cook estimate that hundreds of thousands of Americans have had near-death experiences. But in 1995, when they wrote their journal article, they had to admit that many people who have had such experiences have been ignored, rebuffed, and ridiculed when they tried to describe their experiences to people who had not had them. They feared being judged to have hallucinated. Oh, just the hallucination, <laughs> or being labeled mentally ill, you need to go see a psychiatrist. These fears often inhibited free communication of their experiences to other people, especially their doctors, the very people who could have been recording these experiences so there would be a body of knowledge. Since then, however, through the works of two psychiatrists also at the University of Virginia, and some of you, since I keep referring to the University of Virginia for these phenomena, are going to think it's a wacko university, but it is accredited. <laughs> it is considered a, a university, you know, in good standing. But two psychiatrists, Dr. Raymond Moody and Dr. George Ritchie, whom I personally knew, wrote books about their own near-death experiences and the near-death experiences of others that they came in contact with and that they studied. Return from Tomorrow is one of the titles. I meant to look up the other title and I have forgotten what it is. But when I, in the late 70s and early 80s, when Dr. Ritchie was a member of the Whitestone United Methodist Church with my family, his book, and Dr. Moody's books were just really popular. They were bestsellers. So it really opened up society's willingness to hear some of these stories. So now there are hundreds, if not thousands, of YouTube videos of people recounting their near-death near experiences. In fact, in doing some searching, I found that there are a couple of podcasters who specialize in inviting guests on to tell their stories. So that feeling that you're going to be poo-pooed and dismissed and in some senses thought less than has subsided significantly. Now there are very many facets to this experience. I mentioned before the tunnel, meeting light beings, meeting loved ones, meeting religious figures. But what's intrigued me the most is that a fair number of the ones who were studied in 1995 and of the near-death experience accounts that you can now find in books and on YouTube videos tell something else about the life review. They say that they not only review each moment from their perspective, but they are given an insight into the perspective of the people around them. So if what they were doing at any <laughs> given time brought joy to others, they felt that joy. If it brought pain to others, they felt that pain. We human beings are so judgmental. We often condemn or criticize others without having any idea what that other person's experience is, or by dismissing it because it doesn't quite jive with our own experience, because we use quite naturally, without being mindful, our own experience as the benchmark. Well, if I can do it, you can do it. If I didn't have that experience, you're not having that experience. If I think this way, you can't think that way. Sound familiar? In um, 
In, 19, in 1895, I'm sorry, 1895, Mary T. Lathrop, Lathrop, does that sound right? Lathrop, an American poet, wrote a poem containing the repeated line, walk a mile in his moccasins before you abuse, criticize, and accuse. That line is thought to refer back to, Native Ameri to a Native American adage. I'd like to read you that poem right now. It's titled, Judge Softly. Pray, don't find fault with the man that limps or stumbles along the road, unless you have worn the moccasins he wears or stumbled beneath the same load. There may be tears in his soul that hurt through, though hidden away from view. The burden he bears placed on your back may cause you to stumble and fall too. Don't sneer at the man who is down today unless you have felt the same blow <coughs> that caused his fall or felt the shame that only the fallen know. You may be strong, but still the blows that were his, unknown to you in the same way, may cause you to stagger and fall mm -hmm. too. Don't be too harsh with the man that sins or pelt him with words <coughs> or stone or disdain unless you are sure that you have no sins of your own and it's only wisdom and love that your heart contains. For you know if the tempter's voice should whisper as soft to you as it did to him when he went astray, it might cause you to falter too. Just walk a mile in his moccasins before you abuse, criticize, and accuse. If just for one hour you could find a way to see through his eyes instead of your own muse. I believe you'd be surprised to see that you've been blind and narrow-minded, even unkind. There are people on reservations and in the ghettos who have so little hope and too much worry on their minds. Brother, there but for the grace of God go you and I, just for a moment, slip into his mind and tradition and see the world through his spirit and eyes before you cast a stone or falsely judge his condition. Remember to walk a mile in his moccasins and remember the lessons of humanity taught to you by your elders. We will be known forever by the tracks we leave in other people's lives our kindness, and our generosity. Take the time to walk a mile in his moccasins. Whether you believe in the end of life review or not, let it give you pause. I wonder how many things we would do differently, say differently, have attitudes different than the ones that we do if we knew that we were going to have to have a review of them and judge them ourselves. And if we were to have not only to see them from our perspective, but from the perspective of others, if in the end of life review, we felt the joy and pain that we have caused by our words and deeds. I'm gonna take this moment to share a true confession because I have adopted this several years ago, and it has changed the way I think of situations. I get into kerfuffles from time to time. I get annoyed, frustrated, angry. And then when I am able, when my mindfulness is there, I can sometimes step back and say, how do I want to see this the next time around? And while I might be very scared to approach someone and ask for their forgiveness, or to fess up to something wrong that I have done, the notion that I might have to live through it again without any effort at reconciliation or any effort at compassion or kindness gives me the courage 
to go ahead and try. I have a huge regret in my life right now. As many of you know that my mother recently died back in January, and I am now the trustee for a disabled sister. She's got Asperger's, she's very highly functioning, but taking care of business, even very normal minor things is beyond her. She doesn't have a filter emotionally. So when she's really, really happy, she's all over you really, really happy. When she's really, really mad, she comes at you like that and she's really, really mad. Fortunately, those emotional states don't stay around for a long time, but they make it very difficult to do things in public, for instance. With her, and for years, I and my other sister have taken her child and our children to Bush Gardens, to King's Dominion, to the State Fair, and not invited her. There have been family vacations where she was not invited. My mother once said to me, you know, your sister feels left out. And with a bunch of little kids running around, I just let that comment go by. <clears throat> because managing a bunch of little kids seemed to be just about all I wanted to do. And now I am her trustee, and I'm helping her get more. Uh, she never had a real thorough formal diagnosis, and we're working on that. And we're setting up a fund for her, and we're arranging for her living. And I can't help but think it is going to be miserable reliving her pain. So I'm going to do what I can to involve her in things that the family is doing from now on. The kids are all grown, so we don't have to worry about them doing things that we, you know, <laughs> that don't make sense, that get them into trouble, that get somebody hurt. <laughs> and I think I have plenty of bandwidth now to include her. Like, I don't know that she's ever been to King's Dominion. We had seasons passes for five years. And that seems like a silly thing, but if you're a grown-up who's been left out and you sort of operate on a 12-year-old level and like 12-year-old things, kind of big. So as I have tried to incorporate the, that idea that I might have to review this all over again, I have found that though I am still far from perfect, I still have all those feelings of anger and frustration and annoyance, that I'm much quicker to forgive and to seek reconciliation than I was before I thought I might have to review my words and actions. I'm much more intentional in that way. So I invite you now to do your own quick life review. Consider how you might have unnecessarily harmed someone with your words or actions. And also consider, as our wisdom story told us, that we have choices. We can turn fractured relationships and uncomfortable situations into wholeness and health again. We need to dig deep and let our egos go and realize that really the only thing that matters is love and extending that to the people around you. <clears throat> and while our perspectives absolutely matter, so does the perspective of someone else. 